It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has conquered. And Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard. And a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming. Praise God. Sunday's here. Sunday's not just coming anymore. Oh, we can do a little better than that. Sunday's here. It's been Sunday ever since. It's been Sunday ever since. Amen? Amen. We are alive because he's alive. What about Harold on the sax? Wasn't that good? He just put that together this week. Now, actually, Harold is a, he's what they call a professional musician. Y'all know what those are? We got any professional musicians? Harold, you did awesome, man. That was awesome. You'll, you'll be seeing more of, of Harold. That was good. That was good. I almost didn't want to sing on it and mess it up. But uh, I could tell some of y'all were like, what do we do right now? Do we listen? Do we sing? Do we stand? Do we sit? Or how many were thinking that? Do they want us to stand? It's all right. You can stay seated. Well, happy Easter. Happy Resurrection Day. Jesus is alive. He once was dead. It's confirmed. History itself would, would, would tell us he was, he was dead. He was buried. He was in a tomb. But he's not in that tomb anymore. 
Jesus is alive and his resurrection meant something. It wasn't it was it was an event. It's an event in history, no doubt, but but it's more than an event. It's an experience that we get to enter into. We get to experience that same resurrection. And, and, and maybe your mind this morning is having difficulty. You know, what does that mean? You know, resurrection. I know Jesus is alive. There's no doubt about that. I believe that. But what does that really have to do for me? Uh, well, we're going to talk about it today. I'm excited about talking to you about the, 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 the impact of Jesus' resurrection and, and, how, and what does it do for us. I know that a lot of times we speak about resurrection and we think of resurrection in light of eternity. That means we have the opportunity to go to heaven and spend eternity with Christ. I understand that and that, and that is good news. But what about, what about now? What about between here and there? What about life that I've got to live? What, what, what does Jesus' resurrection do for me on my Monday, my Tuesday, and, 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 my, and my, my every day of, of, of my week and my life? And we're going to talk about that today. If you want to turn in your Bibles to, uh, to, to John chapter 20, and before we do that, I just want to quickly uh, make one more announcement because I'm excited about this. You know, Jesus declared this, that he would make his church a house of prayer, that, that the people of God would be a people of prayer. And oftentimes in our busyness, uh, finding time to pray is quite challenging. Would you agree? A lot of times we're praying desperate prayers. We're praying prayers on our, on our way out of trouble, on our way into trouble, on our way into difficulty, and there's nothing wrong with that, okay? The Lord is a deliverer. He is a rescuer. He is a help in, the, in our present time of need. But He wants communion. He wants, he wants you to experience who He is in the place of prayer. He wants you to experience the power of prayer. Scripture talks about availing prayer. That's a big word. Avail means, means a lot of things, but, but He says that that it's the effectual fervent prayers of, of the righteous that avail much. And, and, and if we're ever going to see the power of prayer, we've got to gather for prayer. And so this Wednesday night, first Wednesday night of every month, we gather for a time of focused praise and prayer. Uh, our last time together last month was powerful. It was nothing short of powerful. So this Wednesday night we will gather and, and we're going to be praying this Wednesday night specifically in the seat back in front of you you'll see these cards. We call them the prodigal prayer card. There's also another prayer card here where you can list any prayer need that you have uh, and we will be praying over that need. There will be at least four people praying over that need this Wednesday night. So whatever the need is Please feel free to fill that card out. You can put your name. You don't have to put your name. You can remain anonymous. It doesn't matter. Just fill that card out, and I promise you, we're going to pray over that need. Every card will be prayed over. They're actually prayed over beyond a first Wednesday. They're prayed over during the week, uh, and so uh, we will be praying over those. And then, also, in addition, starting this Wednesday night, we're going to have a segment where we're going to be praying over prodigal sons and daughters, prodigal friends and family. Do y'all know what that means? That means those who once walked with Christ, who, who for whatever reasons are no longer with uh, walking with Jesus. They, they are prodigal, okay? And we love them, and that grieves our heart. And, and we don't want them to stay there. We want them to return. We want them to come back, right? And, and so we're going to begin calling their name out in prayer, okay? And so you're welcome to fill out the date, the name, uh, anything specific that, that we're, maybe they're battling addiction, uh, maybe they're battling some type of stronghold that is just blocking them, keeping them. Maybe they're battling offense. Maybe they're angry with God, offended with God. You just obviously recognize something that is hindering them, that's keeping them uh, from, the, the, you know, a wall between them and God. Go ahead and list that out. And then there's a spot there where we get to put the date when they return to the Lord, all right? So we're praying in faith and believing. So we're going to have a big old board up here. We're going to have their name, and we're going to, it's just going to be a really good time. So that happens this Wednesday night. I want to invite you to be here. Uh, I understand a lot of us come in right after work. Some of us are wearing our work clothes. Some of us still smell like work, all right? Uh, you might grab McDonald's on the way unless you you are weird and eat healthy, and you get a tossed salad. Chick-fil-A has a good tossed salad, all right? Grab a salad, bring your supper, whatever you got to do, just get here. We start at 6.30. We are out by 8, all right? We want to be mindful of the time and get you out of here. So that is this Wednesday night. Are you in John chapter 20? And the church said... 
Sorry, it ain't in me. I, I wish it was. I wish I wish I had a little TD Jakes in me, but uh, it it just it just ain't there yet. All right, modern secularism, or or just society in general. Do, are you are you aware that we're pretty much living in a post Christian society? I know we got in God we trust on our dollar and little things like that, but uh, that's not really true. So we live in a society that, that we are called to love. We're called to be in the world, but not of the world. And, and it's in that world that this world has, a, has a quite, a, quite a few thoughts concerning this resurrected king that we just sang about. Modern society says that Jesus raising from the dead on the third day is perhaps the greatest scandal of all time. These are actual quotes. Some say that the resurrection is not literal, but best, at best figurative. In other words, it didn't happen, but it helps people to live better when they believe that it did. They teach that no one in their right mind would fall into the trap of believing in an empty tomb or a risen body. I get it. I get it. The whole idea of someone raising from the dead, it is indeed impossible, right? It's impossible with man, though. It's impossible with man. It's possible with God. Rudo Boltman, a German, all right? German. He wasn't raised in North Christian. Rudolf Boltman is actually a religious professor. He's passed from this life, but he, he was known for not just writing about the New Testament, but writing books on why it wasn't true. He was a religious professor, and he said this, Bodies do not rise from the dead. And it is high time that Christians, that Christians stop making such claims. Another gentleman, actually, uh, he's still alive, and he lives just right down the road in Nashville because he was also a professor of religion at Vanderbilt University. He has since retired, and he said this, The tomb of Jesus was not empty. As a matter of fact, it was full, and his body did not disappear. It rotted away. And this gentleman wrote books on this claim. My friends, I am not opposed to education. Education is quite advantageous at times in this life, sometimes. But really, that's about all that education will get you when it comes to knowing the truth about Jesus' resurrection. If you're seeking the truth through education, uh, you'll never find it. Education gives you one thing, but there's something else. Encounter gives you a completely different thing. Encounter. Uh, there was... There was a, a gentleman that was very, very educated, uh, very, very, just, just a, a, a mastermind when it came to philosophy and disciplines concerning education. But as much as he was educated, he experienced an encounter with Jesus. His name was Saul. We've come to know him as Paul. Paul had an encounter with Jesus. And this is what he said about Jesus. Jesus, uh, excuse me, Paul wrote a few books too. <laughs> and this is what he said in his book. I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. What he's talking about is I received something from God. I received not education, but revelation. And this revelation did something to me. God told me something, and it caused me to know something, and that knowing something has forever changed my life, and I'm giving it to you. He says this, Christ died for our sins. He was dead, and he died for a purpose on purpose. He died for our sins. And he says, just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just like the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve, and after that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. Yes. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying, I wasn't there with Peter and the others. I wasn't there. I didn't get to see Jesus face to face. I didn't see Jesus face to face, but guess what? I've seen Jesus. 
I've seen Jesus. I've seen him by the way of supernatural encounter. And that encounter with Jesus has forever and radically transformed my life. And God desires for every single one of us to have that same encounter. He wants to go past our minds and encounter our hearts. He wants to become real to us. He doesn't want to be a religion or, 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 or a moral code. He wants to be our Father. He wants to be our friend. He wants to be our Lord. He wants us to experience Him as our King. He wants you to have that same experience. And He is alive. And because He's alive, you can know Him today. You can know Him today. Today is an exciting day for all believers. Praise God. This time last year, we were not here. It, it, it was hard on my heart. I actually was at home and I watched myself on video because we taped the service. I was on the roof last year, right, overlooking the city. I just really wanted to express God's love for our city. There's a lot of critics and, and negative talk about our city. But man, when Jesus thinks about our city, he loves our city. And uh, we talked about resurrection from the roof. And, uh, and I remember last year, last year was hard. But we're here this year. Praise God. We still have some friends and family that are still at home. And we love you. And, and we're praying for you. We miss you. Uh, we wish you were here. But we get it. We understand. We hope that you can be back with us very, very soon. Today is an exciting day for believers all across the world. I was checking out different uh, Good Friday services and Easter services, and just uh, it was just exciting to see the church assembled all across the world. If you get on YouTube, you can actually catch services all the way over in Australia. You know, isn't that crazy? Technology is amazing. So I got to see all these services and just watch the body of Christ celebrate our risen King. And I can only imagine what it was doing to God's heart what it was doing to his heart and how it was moving him. But I want you to know as we celebrate uh, the victory over the enemy of our soul, over death, uh, Hebrews 2.14 tells us that though Jesus is dead, Jesus was destroyed and he destroyed the power of death. He destroyed the power of death, Scripture says. Sorry, my, there we go. Though Jesus was dead, Jesus has destroyed the power of the devil who had power of death over us. I, we, we, we talk about it a lot here at Restoration House. Death, no doubt, is an event. The, the reality is Scripture's told us, and we all know this simply because we've experienced, we're all going to die. die is, death is a fact. It is a reality. We will all die, but we won't all die. We'll all have funerals unless we uh, meet Jesus in the rapture. Uh, we're, gonna, we're going to be buried one day. We're going to pass from this life into eternity, but we'll not all die. Because death has been defeated. Uh, there's the event called death, but there's something else. There's the, the spirit of death. The spirit of destruction and decay. The spirit of discouragement. The spirit of depression. All of that is the spirit of death. We know death is an event, but death is really a state of being. Some people live dead. Some people are breathing, but they're not alive. They're living lifeless. They don't have hope. They don't have joy. They don't have peace. They don't have purpose. They live outside of God's presence. They don't feel the safety and the warmth and the comfort uh, of God's presence, the leadership of His presence. They live outside of His promises. They live outside of His provision. They live outside of His power. Everything that they are doing in life is, 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 is apart from God. They're on their own. They're on their own. That's death. But Paul says death has been defeated. What is Paul saying? He's saying you don't have to live there. You don't have to live life like that. That, that was never God's intent. That was never God's desire. Jesus said that he came to bring the opposite of death. Jesus said that I've come that you would have life, not breath, life. Life, not oxygen, life, eternal life. That you would have life and have it more abundantly. Do you know that life? Be honest with yourself. Do you, are you living that life? Are you living that abundant life today? God knew that you would be here today. This is ordained of God. You may have come at the invitation of someone else. 
You, 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 you may have thought, you, have made, you, you might be thinking, well, I made a choice to be here, but I want you to know God knew before he ever formed the foundations of the earth that you would be here today under the sound of this truth. Amen. He knew that you would be here today, and he is ready to speak to the deep parts of your heart. Go ahead and exhale. Just relax for a moment. There's no condemnation here. The Lord is wooing your heart. He's drawing you. He loves you. You're here because of his love. If you don't know that resurrected king today, if you don't know that life that he gives, you can know that by the end of this service today. You can enter into that today. Easter is an exciting event. It's, a, it's an exciting day for us, but, but that first Easter, that first resurrection morning uh, was not so exciting. Uh, it was quite dark, actually. For Jesus' closest friends and followers, it, it, it seemed like the worst day of their life. It, I don't know if you've ever had a worse day in your life, but that's exactly what it felt like. Jesus had died. He was dead. And though Jesus had promised and prophesied, he said this, You destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Even though they had heard that over and over for three years... When their reality begins to challenge their theology, they begin to doubt. Anybody ever been there? Believing one thing and seeing another? Gosh, I've been there a bunch of times. And, and it's amazing, even though Jesus for three years told them over and over, listen, I'm going to die, I'm going to die, I'm going to be crucified, but don't worry, in three days I will come back to life. They had forgotten about that. Don't judge them. We would have been just like that. We do the same things. Like us, when circumstances change around us, we forget the promises that God has spoken to us. And the disciples and the followers of Jesus, they weren't thinking victory and celebration. They weren't singing. They weren't thinking saxophone solos and, and all this great stuff that we get to celebrate. They weren't celebrating at all. They were hiding out. They are feeling defeat, they are feeling sorrow, they are feeling pain, they are feeling deep loss, they are feeling fear, they are feeling something called hopelessness, they are feeling shame, they are feeling regret, they are feeling guilt. You think of every negative emotion, they're feeling it. They're feeling it. They aren't just feeling it, they are paralyzed by it. They are feeling a loss of purpose, a loss of direction, a sense of direction. Perhaps some are even now fighting to believe if the words and the ministry uh, 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 and the very claims of Jesus were even true. They might have even been thinking, you know, what have we been doing for the last three years? Have we been wasting our time? Well, we gave up everything. Peter, I gave up everything to follow him. And where is he at now? It wasn't supposed to go like this. This is not how I planned it. This is not how I saw it. This is not how I thought God told me it would happen. And it is happening completely different than I ever expected. Can I take you to that morning, uh, that, that Sunday morning, that Easter Sunday morning, uh, 2,000 years ago? In John chapter 20, it starts out like this. Early on Sunday morning, just like us, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Now, she wasn't excited at that moment. She's not thinking resurrection. She's thinking that someone has stolen his body. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved. That's John. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter. I don't know why they put Put that in there I guess just to make Peter look bad he's slow all right he reached the tomb first he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there but he didn't go in then Simon Peter arrived and went inside he also noticed the linen wrappings laying there while the cloth had uh, covered Jesus's head was folded up and laying apart from the other wrappings then the disciples who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Here it is, verse 10. 
So they went home. We're done. I mean, it wasn't that simple. I mean, it's just four words, but th this is big. We're done, guys. It's over. Just go back to, to, to just trying to make it through life. All right? We've lost purpose. We've lost direction. Hope, it's gone. The one that we love so much, he's gone. Sorrow. All of them, no doubt, are dealing with it very differently. I want you to try to feel what they're feeling for a moment. I have, I have felt that in my life. I've, I've been there. I don't know if you've ever prayed prayers like this, but God, if, if I don't wake up in the morning, that's okay with me. Anybody ever been there? That's what they're feeling. That's what they're feeling in that moment. The reality that their leader, their teacher, their friend, their Lord, he's dead. He's gone. And rather than accepting a possible miracle, they fear the worst. They're not thinking miracles. <laughs> They're humans right now. They're not world changers. This whole ministry stuff, we'll get to that later. We've lost somebody we love, and he's not coming back. And then on top of that, they fear that someone has taken his body, grave robbers, or perhaps Pharisees. And I think it's interesting to note in verse 10 that after three years, their journey with Jesus, it's over. And here's the culmination of three years, seeing Lazarus raised from the dead, the feeding of 5,000 twice, Peter walking on water, blind eyes being opened, crippled backs being straightened, deaf ears being opened. You talk about an adventure. We're done. They went home. They went home. They retreated. They abandoned. They took their hands off the plow. The Bible says that Peter didn't even go home. He went back to fishing. <laughs> he went back to fishing. I mean, he went home and got his stuff. You know, you got to have some good tackle. And so he goes home and gets the tackle and he heads to the lake. He heads to the sea. He's done. Jesus had been telling them for three years, even though you kill me, even though I will die, I will rise from the dead. And like us, we let what we're going through get us in or, 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 or get in us. We let what's around us get in us and we let it get to our heads and we let it get to our hearts. And, 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 and what's happening around us, even though we've had the promises of God in us, what happens around us starts to push those promises out of us, right? We know exactly what these followers of Jesus are feeling because we've been there. Can you say this with me? But God. God is about to flip the script. And thank God that his promises do not depend on my performance. Hallelujah. Thank God that he's bigger than my doubt. Thank God that he's bigger than my discouragement. Thank God that, that, that he always has a better story and a better outcome than what I've imagined. And we go on in verse 11. Mary was standing outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she stopped, or excuse me, she stooped and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head. Now these other guys, they've gone home. They didn't stay there long enough. <laughs> Mary stayed behind, and she gets to see angels in the tomb. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head and the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been lying. Dear woman, why are you crying? <laughs> Does anybody ever read stuff and just crack up in the Bible? Angels, you guys should be a little smart. What do you mean, why am I crying? You know why I'm crying. They're not asking to get, a question, to get an answer. They're asking her to change her understanding and her perception of what's going on. Why are you crying, the angels asked her. Because they've taken away my Lord, she replied. And I don't know where they've put him. She turned to leave and saw someone staying there. It was Jesus. 
Sorry, this moment's for me. Jesus was standing there, but she didn't recognize him. That's what sorrow will do to you. It'll blind your sight to see Jesus. Dear woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, you better tell me where you've put him, and I will go and get him. Boy, she's fierce. Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and she cried out. She'd heard that voice before. Rabboni, which is Hebrew for teacher. Does anybody know who this Mary is? There's quite a few Marys in the New Testament. And, uh, you know, uh, even me, sometimes I got to stop and Google it, right? Well, I Googled it again just to make sure I was pointing out the right Mary. This is Mary Magdalene, or, or excuse me, Mary of Bethany. This is the Mary that we see worshiping at the feet of Jesus in Luke 10. This is the Mary, the sister of Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead in John 11. This is the Mary that we see in John 12 who pours a pint of very expensive perfume. Some say it was a year's worth of salary. Pours it on the feet of Jesus as an act of worship and begins to wash them, wash those feet with her hair. This is the Mary. This Mary has loved Jesus, served Jesus, worshiped Jesus, trusted Jesus with all of her heart and affections up until this moment for three years. This, this Mary was radically changed by Jesus. Can you imagine hearing the voice of Jesus call your name? Can you imagine the flood of hope and joy that rushes in into her heart in that moment, that heart that was overwhelmed with despair and sorrow, and in an instant the voice of Jesus, the one whom you've loved and served, speaks and all of that sorrow and that fear and that worry and that heartbreak just, just, just runs. Mary is at the tomb because all of her hope and really all of her reason for living seems gone. She's there because the weight of sorrow has brought confusion and she doesn't know what to do. She doesn't know where to go. She was feeling dead. She was breathing, but, but she was not alive. Jesus knew how much Mary loved him. And in that moment, we see a resurrected Jesus defeats Mary's sorrow. In an instant, he defeats her sorrow. He ends her confusion. He lifts her from her confusion. He rescues her from her confusion. His presence destroys her darkness. Amen? Amen. And it's in that moment that Jesus fulfills the promise of Isaiah that says this, To all who mourn in Israel, He will give a crown of beauty for ashes. In other words, He won't let you stay there. He won't let you stay there in that place of sorrow and mourning. He will actually trade your sorrows and He will give to you beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. Anybody ever receive that? Anybody ever receive that trade-off? That's His promise. And God keeps His promise. And that promise is for every single one of us here today. Jesus comforts Mary, and then He turns to her, and He says this, I need you to go find my brothers and tell them something. Tell them I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene found the disciples and told them, I have seen the Lord. Then she gave them this message. This is what she says. That Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid. They're afraid, and they are hiding out. Does anybody know what's going through their minds? They think they're next. They just crucified Jesus. It, it just makes sense that, that they're going to find his followers next. Jesus caused so much trouble for the Pharisees that, that, that they're not done yet. They've got to get rid of his posse. They've got to get rid of the troublemakers. And so they are hiding out. They were afraid of the Jewish leaders. And guess what? Suddenly... Jesus was standing there among them. And what did he say? I love Jesus' first words. See, first words matter. And what does he say? He says, peace. Peace. See, the opposite of fear is not faith. It's peace. He speaks to them. Peace. Peace be with you. Guess what? Peace is with them. <laughs> peace is in the room. 
Peace is personified in Jesus. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and his side, and they were filled with joy. Man, just in an instant, they go from fear and worry and sorrow. Jesus steps in the room. Just one moment in the presence of Jesus changes everything. And the Bible says that they were filled with joy as they saw the Lord. Our resurrected Jesus defeats Mary's sorrow. And here we see our resurrected Jesus. He defeats the disciples' fear. Fear. I don't know if you've ever experienced the spirit of fear. The Bible calls fear not an emotion, even though we know it as an emotion. Fear is a spirit. Spirit. It is a spiritual uh, being, beings that work to, to, to imprison you and, and control you by way of fear. Have anyone ever been held hostage by fear? I have. I have. The fear of the unknown. The fear of losing. The fear of failing. The fear of rejection. The fear of not having enough. The fear of being overlooked. The fear of being accused. Honestly, the list of possible fears goes on and on and on and on. Fear drives out peace. It strips us of joy and laughter. Fear paralyzes. Fear robs us and then it enslaves us. That's what the disciples are feeling. And Jesus responds with what? Peace be with you. I know without a doubt there are some here today. That's exactly what you need. You may not be able to articulate your need, but I'm telling you right now, it is the peace of God that surpasses your understanding that you are in great need of today. You are in a war. Oh, you're getting up every day. You're getting through your day, but you're in a war. Jesus didn't speak it. He gave it. He didn't just speak peace. He gives peace. Peace be with you. His presence brings His peace. Amen? Because Jesus lives... You can come today and you can have His peace because you can experience His presence. That same resurrected Jesus that shatters the fear of the disciples in John 20 is the same resurrected Jesus that is alive today and will shatter your fears. But you have to get into His presence you have to open a door. You have to be willing to say, Lord, come in, come in. I, I, I like the fact that he didn't open any doors that day. They wouldn't have opened them. That's how, that's how paralyzing, that's how strong fear was in their life. Even if someone would have knocked on the door, they wouldn't have opened it. So Jesus says, I ain't waiting for a door to get open. He just suddenly appears. Not only were the disciples hiding in fear, they had taken their eyes off their purpose. They had forgotten about the call upon their life. For three years, Jesus had been training them, equipping them, teaching them to be world changers. And in that moment, the world was changing them. They were not world changers. What was happening in their world had changed them and had caused them to run and hide. Some of you here today, that's where you're at. You're hiding from your purpose. Words, prophetic words, words of knowledge have been spoken over you. Prayers have been prayed over you. You know deep in your heart there's a call upon your life. You know that you've been set apart for the work of God. And you're not living it. For whatever reasons, you're not living it. And that's exactly where these, these disciples were. They said, we're done. <laughs> Don't call us disciples anymore. We're just regular old guys now. Look at what the resurrected Jesus does, starting in verse 21. Again, he said, peace be with you. He says it a second time. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, and I like the fact he don't sit down and have a discussion. He doesn't do any counseling. Jesus doesn't stop and say, well, guys, tell me about what you're feeling. No, he doesn't even address that. In, I mean, he addresses it. He addresses it by declaring his word and his promise, peace be with you. And he says, just like the Father sent me, guess what, guys? Get your eyes back on your purpose. I am sending you. I am sending you. I'm sending you back into the world. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus doesn't even have a discussion about their retreat or, or, or their retreat into what we're going to call purposelessness. 
He doesn't even take time to talk about it. He knows what's going on. He doesn't even give, give them time to explain themselves. He just looks at them and he points them back into the world that they've just ran from and says, listen, guys, get out of this room. You're going back into the world that I've been training you to love and lead for the last three years. Get your eyes back on your purpose. It's not time to go back to fishing. It's not time to go back to your old way, your former life. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And it's here that we see a resurrected Jesus. He defeats the disciples' purposelessness. He defeats that, 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 that life of mere existence. You were made for more than a paycheck on Friday. You are made for more than just a weekend and mowing yards. You are made for more than just having babies and raising those sweet little pretty cute things. You are made for more than retirement. You were made for more than an annual three-week vacation. You were made for more than paying bills. You have purpose. You have reason. When you were in your mother's womb, the Lord knew you. The very fact that you are alive today is ordained of God. You could have been one of the aborted ones. You could have been gone early. Those accidents that he protected you from, that near-death experience, that, that COVID-19 that should have taken your life. You have purpose. You have, you have a calling. Every single one of you have calling and purpose. Don't take your eyes off of that purpose. Listen, it is time. No, Scripture says in the King James, it's high time. It's high time. What does that mean? That means you ain't got no more time to waste. It is time now to say yes to the calling and the purposes of God. The resurrection declares that you have eternal purpose. God has something for you. And yes, it is bigger than you. And yes, it's scary. That's what makes it God. <laughs> if God handed you something that you could do, you wouldn't need God to get it done. So the purpose of God is bigger than you. No, you don't have what it takes. You don't have the money to do it. You don't have the wisdom to do it. It's a setup by God. God is setting you up to need Him to accomplish everything He's called you to do. So stop doing self-inventory. When it comes to saying yes to the purposes of God, God will never call you to do what you can do. He'll call you to do what you can't do so that you need him to get it done. It will be difficult because it's going to require faith. And there will be challenges along the way because it needs to be born and birthed and, and facilitated by prayer. We have a way, I don't know about y'all, but when things are going good for me, I forget to pray. Does anybody else deal with that? Whew, good, I'm glad I'm, no, y'all are weird. This year needs to be the year that you say yes to your purpose, and I really mean that. This year needs to be the year that you say yes, no matter the cost, no matter the sacrifice. No matter the sacrifice, we go on. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, Thomas, we've seen the Lord. Oh, but I like Thomas because there's some Thomases here today. What does he say? I'm not going to believe it unless I see it. I like Thomas. I like Thomas. Thomas will be on my team. Okay, after we do a pep talk. Yeah, Thomas is just saying, listen, listen, guys, that sounds good, but uh, y'all are crazy, and I ain't going to believe it until I see it. I actually, you know what? I'm not going to believe it until I can put my fingers. <laughs> I like it. He's graphic. I want to put my fingers in there, and I want to see. I want to place my hand into the wound on his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But suddenly, again, and this time Thomas was among them. Guess what? Peace be with you. Jesus shows up, and he says, Thomas, 
I heard what you said. Look at what Jesus does. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Jesus is personal. He's personable. He, he, he knows you. He knows you. And he looks at Thomas and says, Thomas, come here. Come here. Put your hand. Put your finger. Get in there, Thomas. <laughs> Get in there. So that you can see, Thomas, it's real. Don't be faithless any longer, Thomas. I want you to believe. My Lord and my God, I love Thomas. Thomas, you want to see it to believe it? Okay, you got it. And what does he say? My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, you believe because you have seen in me. But Thomas, let me grow you up. My mercy has met you here today, but we're going to grow you up, son. I need to get you past the place of having to see it to believe it. Because blessed are those who don't see it and still believe. You're going to get there. Maybe you're here today and you're, and you're like, listen, I, I'm very much like Thomas. God will meet you where you're at. God, God, God will never, ever, ever ask you to jump up and get him. The fact that he came to this earth 2,000 years ago is a forever declaration that God recognizes your weakness and your inability. And he'll come to you. He will come to you. And he will find you. But when he gets there, you better let him in. You better let him in. You better let him in. Let him come in and let him begin to do the work of changing you. Thomas, blessed are you when you've come to that place to where you can believe. And you don't have to see it. That's called what? Faith. Thomas, you needed proof. I'll give it to you. But Thomas, I'm growing you up to have faith. I won't believe it until I see it. I've been there. Ever wanted to believe, but you couldn't because you couldn't see it? I mean, part of your heart, you know, we've all been there. It's called doubt. Wanting to believe, but struggling to believe. It's that war between I hope... You know, what I hope it will be and, and what I see it to be, right? We've been there. He had forgotten the promises of God, and that's a problem when it comes to faith because what Jesus says, Jesus will do. What Jesus says, Jesus will do every single time. Jesus told Thomas in Luke 24, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners. He must be crucified, but on the third day, he will be raised again. Thomas heard those words. What Jesus says he will do. What has God told you? What has God told you a year ago, two years ago, three years ago? What has he told you in secret? What did he tell you that night when you were all alone crying out for God to speak? What did he whisper to you? Have you forgotten about it? You need to recall it. Because what God says He will do, He will do. The promises of God are yes and amen. I want to tell you something. God cannot fail. He will never fail you. He will never fail you. We're almost finished. Because we're almost running out of John chapter 20. <laughs> Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which were not recorded in the book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Later, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is now, or excuse me, how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, and guess what? Peter finally shows up. Now, I don't know if you all notice anything, but Peter hasn't been around. After the tomb, he went, he left. He went home, got fish and tackle, went back to fishing. We've not seen him. He was not in, the, in that room the two times that we see Jesus. But where is Peter now? He's at the lake. He's at the lake. Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. The whole gang's there is exactly what they're trying to say. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. And he calls out, 
Hey, fellas, have you caught any fish? Now, Jesus knows good and well they hadn't caught any fish. But Jesus has a little bit of character in him. I like Jesus. He has a good sense of humor. I can see him kind of laughing. Maybe a few bystanders. Watch this. I'm going to watch this. Hey, you guys caught anything? And if they're anything like me, don't ask stupid questions. Right? No! And leave us alone. Mind your own business. No, we haven't caught anything. You can see that for yourself. Then he said, well, guess what, guys? Throw your nets on the other side, on the right side of the boat, and you'll get some. So they did, and they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, you know who that is, don't you? That's the Lord. That's the Lord. It's here on the shores of the Sea of Galilee that Jesus has come to meet one person. I'm convinced. And that's Peter. Jesus is only there because he's already encountered the others. But Peter hasn't been around. He is there to meet Peter. But why? Why? First, where has Peter been? He's been nowhere. We haven't seen him. You have to go all the way back to John 10, chapter, or verse 20, to see where Jesus, excuse me, Peter has been. He's been at home. Peter, like the rest of the disciples or the followers of Jesus, is dealing with sorrow. He's dealing with fear. He's dealing with purposeless. He's dealing with uh, doubt. But Peter, unlike the others, is dealing with something that the others are not dealing with. And this is where some of you all are here today dealing with. He's dealing with shame. I did something a long time ago that I can't undo. I didn't do it unknowingly. I did it knowingly. I did it on purpose. I did it because I wanted to. I did it because I didn't have the strength not to do it. See, Peter is dealing with shame. And he's dealing with guilt. He's dealing with regret. He's dealing with the past that he can't go back and undo. I don't know if you know it, but Peter's last words to Jesus are pretty significant. This is actually what Peter said to Jesus, the very last words. He says to Jesus... They're all at supper, and Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. He's about to be betrayed. It's it's that whole passion of the Christ moment where he's getting ready to to, to be betrayed by the kiss of Jesus. And then, you know, it's the Garden of Gethsemane and all of those moments. I mean, it starts to happen very quickly. It happens through the course of one night, through the night. Peter tells Jesus, Even if everyone else deserts you, Jesus, I'm never going to do it. Anybody ever told the Lord that? Anybody ever made a vow to Jesus? I've I've done that. Lord, you just get me out of this moment, Lord, and I'll go to Africa. I'll preach anywhere, do anything you want. Anybody ever prayed those prayers? Again, I'm the only one. Man, y'all are making me feel bad. Thank you, thank you. We see some confession here. I've prayed some of those desperate prayers. I've made some of those bold declarations. God, you just come through for me, and I'll never leave you. I'll ne- I will be by your side till the end. Jesus turns to, to Peter and says, Peter, brother, I love you, but you're going to betray me. You're going to betray me. And what does Peter do? No, no, no. Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. Guess what? Peter not only denied Jesus once, Peter denied Jesus three times. He denied Jesus three times after Jesus told him, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. You would think after the first one, Peter would be like, wait a minute, I don't need to do this again. There's two more times coming. But Peter does it. That's what sin is. 
Actually, that's what transgression is. Transgression is, I know I shouldn't do it, but I'm going to do it, and I don't care what happens. Sin is, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Transgression is, I did it, and don't be talking to me about it. It's transgression. That's sin. He was bruised for our iniquities and transgressions. Mike, you can come this morning. It's at the death of Jesus that Peter goes home, and I believe that he went back home to get ready to go back to his old life. He went home, and there he was living in regret and shame. Regret because he can't go back and undo what he's done. Guilt because he, didn't, he, he, he did the exact opposite of what he, he, he said he wouldn't do. Shame because he denied knowing the one who had loved him so faithfully. This, 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 this Jesus, you gotta, you got to think about the relationship that Peter had with Jesus. Peter got to do things with Jesus that no one else got to do. I mean, they, they had a very, very close relationship. Jesus, no doubt, had to be very patient with Peter, but that was the expression of Jesus' love for him. You ever been there? You ever been in that place of shame and guilt and regret? You know, if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't do it because now I know how much it costs. I know how much it hurts. I, I don't, I don't want to be guilty of that again. I would go a different direction. Well, praise God for something called mercy. 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 I think we know about grace, but we don't talk enough about the mercy of God. The mercy of God. God, you should, you should pretty much destroy me right now, but you're not going to. The mercy of God. God doesn't get offended. God doesn't walk away. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that He doesn't get offended. He loves and He pursues us in our failures. He pursues us in our mistakes. He finds us in the prisons of our regret, our guilt, and our shame. And He comes in and He liberates us. That's why He has come to the Sea of Galilee. That's why he's at the Sea of Galilee. And from the shore in verse 6, he calls out to Peter, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some fish. John 21, 6. Now, I don't know if you know your Bible, but this ain't the first time that Peter has heard these words. This is the second time that he's heard the words, throw your nets on the other side. What you have to remember is that, 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 G, that Peter has heard these words before three years ago. Three years ago, before this moment, when, when all Peter was was a fisherman. Scripture calls him an uneducated fisherman. What does that mean? When Peter was a nobody, Jesus came along and made him a somebody. Before he had met Jesus for the first time, he had heard these words for the first time. It's these same words three years ago that ended up being the very words that forever changed Peter's life. It's these words that brought him into an exciting relationship and life with Jesus. It's these words, the words that called to him to be the very thing that he no longer felt he could be. What? A disciple of Jesus. Peter's done being a disciple of Jesus. Why? I've blown it. I've blown it. I can't, I, I'm not worthy of this. I've done too much. I can't undo what I've done. I have to go back to being a fisherman. Man, that's what shame will do to you. Shame will convince you that God doesn't want you anymore. That's such a lie such a lie I don't care what you've done I don't care how many times you did it I don't care who you did it with and when you did it God still wants you you're thinking Brad come on man you really don't know what I've done listen you name it the, love, the blood of Jesus covers it the forgiveness of God forgives it it doesn't matter you say if he would just forgive me I would come right back into relationship. If he would just forgive me, listen, I'm here to tell you, he's ready. He's ready. When I think about the prodigal sons and daughters, I think about all those 
that have bought into the lie of the enemy of their soul, Satan. And it's not the voice of God that they're hearing, it's the voice of the enemy that has convinced them that you can't go back home. We're going to be praying for them this Sunday night. I believe this is the year that you're going to see prodigal sons and daughters come home. John looks at Peter and he tells Peter, 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 it's the Lord. It's the Lord. I'm convinced that, Peter, that, that, that John didn't have to tell Peter. Peter knew who that was. Peter knew in an instant who that was. The Bible tells us that when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, watch this. He put on his tunic for he had stripped for work. He jumped into the water and he swam to the shore. He headed to the shore. Immediately, without hesitation, Peter jumps out of the boat and begins to swim. Guess what? He can't walk on water this time, but he sure can swim this time. He's made some mistakes. He's failed. His faith isn't as sharp as it was. I believe he was even telling himself, I believe it even went through his mind. Listen, the last time Jesus told me to come to him, I walked on the water. I can't do it this time. I've taken a fall. I've tripped. I've done some things that I can't undo. But listen, I'm going to get to him any way I can, even if I have to swim to him. It's in that moment that our resurrected Jesus, he completely destroys, completely destroys Peter's regret and his guilt and his shame. Do you remember when Jesus did that for you? Do you remember when he when he lifted, when he lifted, when he when he opened the door to that prison called shame and regret and guilt? Do you remember when he set you free? That's what we're singing about today. That's listen, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I get to spend eternity not in hell and with Christ forever. But listen, I can't wrap my mind around that if I'm going through hell on earth. It's hard to think about heaven if every day getting up is, is, is something that I dread. And there's some of you here today that, that, that you dread what, what the next day holds. And God has not called you to live like that. That is not what sons and daughters of God, that is not your inheritance. And that's not where God's called you to live. That is not the will of God for you. The Lord wants to lift you out of that place of sorrow, out of that place of, of, of purposelessness. He wants to lift you out of that place of doubt. He wants to lift you out of that place of fear. He wants to lift you out of that place of regret, guilt, and shame. Only a God, a loving God, only a resurrected Savior can do that for you today. Psalm 85, or excuse me, 86 says this, For you, O Lord our God, you are ready to forgive. Say that with me. You are ready to forgive. Say it again. You are ready to forgive. Abundant in mercy to all who call upon you. In just a minute, we're all going to call on the name of the Lord. We're all going to call on the name of the Lord. I don't know about you, but I need a refresher. I need a refresher. I want my heart to be reminded again of the mercy of God and how He has set me free. Listen, you don't know me like I know me. I, I can't point back to addiction, but you know what? I know where I would be if it wasn't for Jesus. I don't know why He saved me at an early age, but I am so grateful that He has. And you may be here and you may be in what we call the old age, but it's never too late. It's never too late. Jeremiah 31 says, I will forgive their sin and their iniquity and their sin. I will remember it no more. Oh, you got to get a hold of that. Do you know something about God? God don't forget nothing. Why? Because He's omniscient. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. So how can a God that knows everything forget something? Because he chooses to. He chooses to. That's what love does. Love keeps no record of wrongs. <laughs> that, that's why he deserves your whole life. keeps no record of wrongs.
That's what that empty tomb provides for you today. I love Easter. I love the whole celebration. I love little cream puffies with gooey sugar in it. I love, I love, I love yesterday hearing the kids laughter. Man, it felt so good to hear kids laughing after a year of solitude. I love Easter. I love the beautiful weather. I love that you're here. I believe even next year is going to be an even more explosive, bigger Easter. I love that you're here. I love this celebration. But listen, that's all it is. If we don't get a hold, if we don't encounter this resurrected Jesus, if we don't let resurrection power come in and drive out everything that speaks of and hints of death. You may have come in these doors. You, Some of you, I, I even sense some of you came in here and you even said, listen, if they have an altar call, I'm not going up. You don't have to raise your hand, but I already know you're here. I can sense you. I can sense you're here. And the Lord would say to you today, I love you. I love you, but today's the day. Does they, today's the day that, that, that new life begins. New life begins. Would you stand with me today?